Hello, calculus people. This is your pre-recorded lesson for Friday, in which we're going to talk a little bit about our next integration technique, which is known as integration by parts. Now, we've already looked a little bit at the substitution method and have used um, that method to solve a couple integrals. And remember that the substitution method undoes the chain rule. What integration by parts is going to do is hopefully undo the product rule. Okay, so I'm going to call integration by parts IBP. Uh, if you see that online or in the textbook, it just means integration by parts. So the main idea of integration by parts is to help you undo um, an integral that may have to involve a product rule. Okay, so in other words, you know, I started with a function, I went through the product rule, I get a thing, an expression, and um, that's the thing that's now inside of the integrand. So uh, usually what happens when we use the product rule, just by the way it's set up, is you kind of get stuck with these like awkward multiplications of functions. So integration by parts is typically a really nice strategy to try to use um, after substitution. So if you don't think substitution is going to work for the particular product that you have inside the integrand, then IBP is the next best thing. So um, like I said, it's, it's not something, it's, it's one of your more basic strategies, I would say, but you typically don't try it until after you've attempted the substitution and the substitution just kind of keeps failing. Um, and the reason we try I integration by parts after, as you're going to see, is it tends to just take a little bit more time. So whereas we can typically set up substitution and execute it kind of quickly, integration by parts is always going to involve the, maybe a couple extra steps here at the end. Or sometimes we may have to do it twice in a row as well. So typically why we try to work on substitution first. So here is the um, uh, product rule, by the way, in case you've forgotten about it. Um, so product rule, let's say we have um, two functions, let's call them u and v, since that's how we typically are going to label our integration by parts things as well. The product rule says if I have these two things multiplied together and I would like to find the derivative of these two things, then we get the following. We get the derivative of the first, Okay, so du over dx, so derivative of the first, times the second, so du over dx times v. And then we add to that the derivative of the second, so dv over dx times the first. So this is the product rule. Okay, so you should know this already. We covered this in first part of calculus. Um, that is the expression that we want to kind of think about. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to integrate this with respect to x, okay? So I'm going to go through, I'm going to integrate both sides. So I'm going to take integral of the derivative with respect to x. And over here on the right-hand side, um, because integrals can be distributed to uh, through uh, an addition like this, we're going to end up with two integrals. We're going to have an integral of du over dx times v um, with respect to x. And then we're going to get a secondary integral here of dv over dx times u time, uh, with respect to x, okay? So the dx's pop up because we're integrating with respect to x, which means when we go to form these little tiny rectangles, all those little rectangles are going to have a width dx. Now, this is quite nice because we can actually do a little bit of simplification here on the left-hand side. We know that the antiderivative of the derivative is the function. So using the FTC, 
we know that this expression should come out to be u times v. It should just return the original function, right? The integral of the derivative is just itself. So that's what happens to the left-hand side. Over on the right-hand side, we also get a really interesting kind of simplification because when we're taking the derivatives using the product rule, we always end up with a, a, a division essentially by this differential dx. So when we go to run through uh, the integration, these dx's end up um, are going to end up canceling out um, in the following way. So those dx's would essentially kind of disappear and give us one. These dx's would essentially kind of disappear and give us a, a value very close to one. And what we get over here on the right hand side is now we have an integral of the function v with respect to the u variable and an integral of uh, the function u with respect to the v variable. And this is typically how integration by parts uh, the formula looks. Um, and we just are going to do a little bit of rearranging here just to get it into a form that's going to be helpful for us. So we're going to take integral of u times some differential, and we're going to set that equal to u v minus integral of v du. So this is typically the integration by parts formula that you will see inside of most standard calc textbooks. So this is IBP formula. Okay, so just kind of stepping back and taking a look at the product rule, right? We know the product rule, we essentially integrate everything and do a little bit of rearranging and that gives us a setup for something that would hopefully undo a product of two things. And what we want to notice here inside the IBP formula is essentially how these things are gonna be related to each other. So we start with a function u and we start with some kind of thing that's gonna look like a derivative, some kind of differential thing called dv. And the end result that we get after applying integration by parts is the original function v back and the derivative of this u function, the differential of this u function. So IBP tends to be helpful when one of the functions inside of your product is easy to take the derivative of, right, u going to du onto the right-hand side, and one of your functions is easy to take an antiderivative of, dv moving towards v on the right-hand side. So that's just something to kind of maybe note here. So that's how some students kind of look at integration by parts. They'll kind of look at the question and go, oh, okay, well, this piece here is easy to find the derivative of. This other piece is relatively straightforward to find an antiderivative of. And then we kind of smack them together to get this IBP formula. It's going to be, I find it a little more straightforward than substitution. I think like when it comes to substitution, sometimes it can be a little bit of a guessing game as to what to choose for your U substitution. Um, whereas integration by parts, uh, I'll give you kind of a list of um, a more straightforward list of things to try um, when we're working with integration by parts. Um, I think just to kind of get you used to the formula, let's take a look at an example. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of a, a standardized list of kind of what functions are easier to choose compared to other functions. So let's try to integrate something like x times sine of x. So what I would typically do when I see uh, an integral that looks like this, and it's a product, so this is a product of x and sine of x. 
first thing I do is I'm like, this is not one of the basic integrals that we learned at the start of the course. So I'm definitely going to need some kind of technique to integrate this. I check to see if there's a possible substitution. Obviously taking u equals to x has no effect. u equals to sine x is not helpful because the derivative is cosine and that's not there. So substitution really isn't going to get us anywhere if we try to use substitution. So because substitution doesn't work, we might want to try integration by parts. And so what I'm going to do over on the side is just get the initial setup going. And if I look at my formula, what I need to do is identify two things. I need to identify the thing that I would like to take the derivative of, and I need to identify the thing that I would like to take the antiderivative of. So we call u the piece that we'd like to differentiate. Um, I mean, both x and sine of x are fairly straightforward to find the derivative of, but it turns out that x here is going to be a better choice, and we'll see why that's the case in a second. Um, and that's going to leave sine of x dx as the differential portion of our integral. Okay, that's the initial setup. Now we start executing over here on the right hand side what we need in order to alter the initial integral. So let's take the derivative with respect to x, that's one. So we know that du is equal to dx, okay? So like I said, x is very straightforward to take the derivative of. It disappears essentially, returns back the number one. So I know that the differential du and dx um, are going to be uh, proportional here. Um, so that's a good thing. Over on the right hand side, we have this differential dv is equal to sine of x dx. We would like to find the antiderivative of this function. So let's divide by dx. Okay, and then take the antiderivative of sine. So this is one of our more common antiderivatives. So um, one of our one antiderivative we could pick is going to be negative cosine. So we're just going to take the easiest one here. We're going to take the area function essentially um, and not add a plus c to it when I go to integrate. So now we're in pretty good shape. What I need to do is essentially kind of this variable conversion. I need to somehow convert x into uh, a du and I need to convert sine of x dx into its antiderivative. So let's uh, kind of just grab this formula and take a look. So maybe just over here on the side uh, or maybe just underneath we have u dv. Okay, we want to rewrite this as u times v minus the integral of v du. Now most of your work has already been done for you over on the side. Okay, so we need to take x sine x dx, and we're going to rewrite it as u times v, which is negative x cosine x, right? So u times v in yellow. Let's see if I can grab another kind of light color here, and then we need v du, so v du. Um, that's going to be in this lighter pink here, okay? So subtract integral of v du, so negative cosine x dx. Okay, so in other words, I can simplify this initial, or, or I guess change this initial integral to look like the following thing, negative x cosine x. I'm going to simplify our two subtraction signs here into a plus sign. And uh, that's going to change our integrand to cosine x dx. And this is great because essentially what we've done is we've kind of removed this x that was part of the product. So it's this x times a sine of x that's really bothersome. And by taking x to be u, we've reduced the power of it to get 1 times cosine x as a resultant over here on the right hand side. So that's why we typically are going to take nice polynomials over trigonometric functions like this, because eventually my polynomial is going to give me a derivative that's a constant number, and then I have kind of this, the capacity to find the antiderivative over here on the right-hand side. 
So we know the antiderivative uh, of cosine, that is sine. And if we add our constant of integration, now we have the most generalized antiderivative of our starting function. So that's a little walkthrough of the um, process of integration by parts. We kind of identify something that's really nice to take the derivative of. Everything else becomes the differential portion of, of the question, and we hope that we can find the antiderivative of that. Found the derivative of x, that was straightforward. Found the antiderivative of sine, again, fairly straightforward. And then just kind of piece it together using our overall IBP formula. Um, so again, just in pink, we have that uh, over here. So yeah, so hopefully you had that, uh, can see that and how that kind of pieces together. This is one of those techniques where you definitely want to put a little bit of time doing some practice to make sure you're a bit more comfortable, I would say, with some of this stuff. Um, okay, let's take something, something like this we can definitely do. So something like um, x squared e to the x. So just as another example of how we kind of set up and execute integration by parts, and then we'll take a look at some kind of, uh, take a look at some more fun cases, I think. We'll do maybe a looped case. We'll find the antiderivative of the logarithm function as well. So we can find some, once we have integration by parts, a lot of stuff opens up for us to be able to integrate. Okay, so let's take a look at this um, integral we have here, x squared times e to the x. Now again, I want to look at this, it's a product of two functions, x squared and e to the x. So I want to think about whether or not substitution is helpful first. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, well, you know, I, I can't really go u is equal to x because that's not going to be helpful. I can't really go u is equal to x squared uh, and that's not going to be helpful because I don't see 2x floating around here inside of the integrand. So substitutions probably not going to really get us anywhere unless we get super clever with, with a substitution. So in that case, it probably makes a little bit more sense to try integration by parts. So we want to find something that we'd like to take the derivative of and find something we would like to anti-differentiate as well. Like I was hinting at before, it's usually beneficial to take a polynomial as u because we can kind of successively differentiate this and it's eventually going to disappear for us. Uh, and then we just kind of hope that the thing that's left over, the differential portion, which in our case is e to the x uh, dx, we hope that that's relatively straightforward to find the antiderivative of, which in our case we're very lucky it is. Okay, so taking the derivative of our u portion, we are going to get 2x which means that du, when we go to do our substitution, is going to be 2x times dx. Now dividing our differential portion here by dx, we get that the derivative of the function v must be e to the x. So that tells me that the v function must also be e to the x. It must be itself, right? Plus or minus a constant, but we're going to take the easiest um, antiderivative here, the one with the constant equal to 0. Okay, so now we have all of the pieces that we need, and we just have to put this together. So this is going to be equal to uv minus integral v du. Okay, so once again, I'm just going to kind of highlight the pieces we need. uv highlighted in yellow, v du. These two pieces here highlighted in pink. Okay, so uv is going to be x squared e to the x. And v du is going to be e to the x times 2x dx. Okay, so take a step back and kind of analyze this step and see what's happened. What I really am hoping that you're going to see here is that the integrand has... It doesn't look like it's easier to solve, but it's actually starting to become a little bit easier for us to integrate. If I go through the process of integration by parts one more time, hopefully this x squared will eventually kind of degrade to, to the number two. That's what I'm hoping. 
So we've went from x squared to 2x. I'm hoping after one more round of integration by parts, I'm essentially going to have 2 times e to the x. So integration by parts is helpful in this case. We're kind of uh, lowering that polynomial by understanding that its derivative is going to get simpler and simpler. If I had tried to take e to the x as the thing to take the derivative of, for those of you that are curious, that means we have to find the antiderivative of x cubed, so we start increasing powers of x, uh, x squared, sorry, and it just doesn't really get us into a helpful place. So we'll go through integration by parts one more time. We're going to take u equals to 2x, and that's because the derivative of this thing is 2. It becomes a, a really nice derivative to work with. Okay, so if we take 2x to be u, that means everything else that's left over in the integrand must be dv. And of course, we can divide by dx and find the antiderivative and just get e to the x one more time. Okay, so I'm going to write down x squared e to the x. Um, this is, uh, this comes from that first integration by parts that we've done. This second round of integration by parts is going to replace this portion of our question. Okay, so essentially we're going to get minus uv minus integral v du, okay? So let's go ahead and make our substitutions using the information that we have over on the side. Okay, we're gonna get minus uv, so minus 2x e to the x. When I distribute this minus sign through, I'm gonna get plus the integral of v du, so e to the x times 2 dx. Okay, so there's our second round of integration by parts, and now, this is solvable without having to use any special techniques. Okay, so this is e to the x times 2. So if I try to find the antiderivative of that, it's just itself, 2 times e to the x, right? If I look at if I look at this expression right here and I find the derivative of it, I should get 2 e to the x. So here's our final answer. It's a, essentially a decreasing power um, of x times the exponential function. And then, of course, just add your plus c, your constant of integration. Okay, so there's a couple kind of examples of setup and execution. And like I said, I'd like you to, you know, try a couple problems out of the textbook. You guys have access to the integral calculator. Um, the integral calculator is really nice. It'll tell you what to use as u and dv if you get lost, right? So if you're unsure how to start the question, um, you know, toss it into the calculator, see what the calculator says, and see if you can kind of follow the, the process of being able to um, find the antiderivative here. The questions can get a little intense, so just be mindful of that. Um, what I want to do to end off the lesson is give you just some more tools for, um, for your tool belt. So we're going to find the antiderivative of the natural logarithmic function using integration by parts. And that way you can kind of add this to the list of common integrals. So in case this pops up, you can find the antiderivative very quickly. Um, we're also going to um, look at getting, uh, I think, arctan as well. And then we're going to deal with secant and powers of secant um, coming up here. On Monday. So we'll do a couple more examples just to kind of refresh your memory on Monday too. Okay, so natural logarithm function. Let's see. I don't know, it doesn't make sense for us to take dv equals to this. That doesn't make any sense because that's what I'm trying to figure out. If I knew that, I would be done, right? If I knew how to find the antiderivative of ln x, I'd be done. So what we're going to do is we're going to take ln x as the thing that we're going to find the derivative of, and we're going to take what's left over, which is dx, as the um, differential portion of our integration by parts statement. Okay, let's find the derivative of the natural logarithm function, and then we'll just solve for du, and we get the following. Okay, over on the right, we're going to divide by dx to get 1, 
And then we're going to find the antiderivative of, um, of the number 1, which is x. Okay, so if I take the derivative of x, I get uh, a derivative of 1. So this is how we are going to start the question in hopes that it's going to turn into something helpful. So we want to get uv minus v du. Okay, so uv is, well, that's fun. 1 over x times x. No, that's not right. Try again. u is ln x, so we get ln x times x minus v du. That's where the nice thing is. Okay, so that's actually really helpful because this x times 1 over x is going to um, divide out and give us 1. So we're left with x ln x minus the integral of 1 dx. So integrating the number 1, we get the following. So there you go. Here's something new that you can add to your list of common integrals if you need to find an antiderivative of the natural logarithm. It is x ln x minus x. And maybe there's going to be a constant of integration there. So that's nice. Now we have an antiderivative for the natural logarithm. Okay, last one of the day. Let's get to, let's get back in black, as ACDC would say. Last one of the day, let's do the arctan function. And to work with the uh, inverse trig functions, it's very similar to this process that we did with the natural logarithm, and that is, you know, we kind of want to figure out what are we going to take the derivative of, what are we going to take the antiderivative of, and it doesn't really make sense to put arctan over here. Because if I, if I knew the antiderivative of arctan, then I'd be done. So it makes more sense to put arctan here as the u function and the leftover differential as our dv. Okay, so let's go through this process. We're going to find the derivative of u. Um, we know the derivative of arctan is 1 over x squared plus 1. Hopefully you remember that. Um, which means that du is going to be 1 over x squared plus 1 times dx. And over here on the right, we have dv over dx should be equal to 1. And we know that the antiderivative of 1 is x. Okay, And of course, we're not going to take the most general antiderivative here just to keep it a little bit simpler for ourselves. So no extra plus c. We'll save that to the very end here. Alrighty. So using our integration by parts formula, uv minus integral v du. Hi, what's up? I was recording a lesson. I'll come down in a second. I'm almost done. Okay, so u times v, uh, what do we got here? x times, or arctan x times x minus integral of v times du. So here we're going to have x times 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. Okay, so it looks a little janky here over inside the integral, but I think we can make this work with a substitution. This is kind of fun. So kind of the fun part about integration is being able to identify what kind of thing to do um, in different situations. So here, what do we got? We got x over x squared plus 1 with our differential dx. And yeah, I think a substitution will work on this integral. Okay, so let's take u equals x squared plus 1 and find the derivative, which is du over dx. That's equal to 2x. And I noticed that some of that stuff is here. So x and dx are both here. So I'm just going to do a little bit of seductive rearranging over here on the right-hand side. Okay, so du over 2 is equal to x times dx. And that's what we need to make this substitution work. So let's see, what do we get here? x times dx is going to become du over 2. And then 1 over x squared plus 1 becomes 1 over u. So that's what our substitution is going to result for us. 
and that's good. That's going to give us a logarithm function, and this should be good to go. So we have x arc tan x minus, and we're going to pull out that one half, and then 1 over u becomes the natural logarithm function. Um, and don't forget your absolute values. Well, it's not going to matter in the long run here because I am going to substitute u back in. So we know u is x squared plus 1 uh, to get the following um, final antiderivative. And I did drop the absolute values here. That's because it doesn't really matter what the value is for x. x squared plus 1 is always positive. So, I mean, if you leave the absolute value bars here, not a big deal. Um, but, yeah, we can drop the absolute value bars in favor of regular parentheses here just because I know that number is always positive. So there you go. There's another um, antiderivative in case you come across the arctan function. And you need to quickly find an antiderivative for it. It's a little gross. But yeah, this is another one I would just kind of add to your uh, add to your list of, of things, okay? And that one can be done using, like I said, integration by parts. If you want a little bit of practice, a little bit more practice with uh, integration by parts, you can, like I said, go to the textbook. You can also try to find antiderivatives for arc sine and arc cosine as well. Um, I think those are going to be a couple others that are... Um, should be accessible for you and they follow a very similar kind of pattern to what we just saw right here. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to cover with our introduction to integration by parts. Um, so yeah, we'll do some more examples of this on Monday uh, and start working on a couple more helpful formulas that are going to be good as we start working with a bit more trigonometry. Alrighty, well, have a great weekend guys and I will see all of you on Monday.